Welcome to Next Stage, our Q&A on COVID-19 implications for the performing arts. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Aujourd'hui, nous présentons les réponses aux questions que vous avez envoyées sur les répercussions légales à cause du COVID-19 sur les organismes artistiques. The performing arts sector has been and will continue to be one of the hardest hit sectors in this pandemic. Merci à Mélanie Bureau d'avoir nous contacté pour cette session. Ça nous fait plaisir de faire notre part pour Capacoa avec cet webinar. I'm Susan Abramovich. I'm the head of the Entertainment and Sports Law Group at Gowlings. Many of our clients are among uh, your members. We represent performing arts venues, uh, presenters, also writers, composers, performers, and other players in all areas of the arts. I'm also a governor on the Board of Governors of Massey Hall, Roy Thompson Hall. So in that capacity, have been dealing with many of the issues that you all are. Um, for this uh, webinar, just some technical notes. Um, you'll note that the chat is off, uh, disabled for, from your perspective. So you can't chat with us, although we will be sending you some notes in the chat. There's already a couple there. Uh, but you can uh, use the Q&A to send us questions. We won't be dealing with uh, additional questions. We have lots from you already. So we won't be dealing with your live questions now, but please feel free to submit them and we'll try to find a way to answer them uh, after this webinar. Um, in fact, it may be that we answer some of them by way of a, a FAQ or Q&A newsletter. So I recommend strongly that you sign up to receive our newsletter because that may be the way we deliver some of the responses. Gowlings is a full service law firm. That means that we, rep we represent clients in all areas from tax to corporate to employment to litigation. And that allows us to present you with a cast of characters here from all from different sectors of our firm. To introduce them, uh, starting from the bottom, Jemiah Ferdinand Hodkin is a litigation partner in Gowlings Ottawa office. Her practice focuses on commercial litigation entertainment and sports litigation, and professional liability. She is also certified in risk management and assists clients in, to develop risk and crisis management plans. One up from her is Alexis Vaughn, who's an associate in the intellectual property group in Gowling's Toronto office. Her practice focuses on intellectual property litigation, life sciences, and entertainment and sports law. And finally, right under me, Andrew Bratt, is a partner in our, in our Toronto office and the Toronto group leader for the employment, labor and equalities practice. Andrew's practice focuses on all aspects of employment law with a specific focus and expertise in litigating employment disputes. Next slide. Alexis, next slide. Thank you. We won't spend a lot of time on this. I fought very hard for this slide not to be included in this webinar, but uh, it is important to know that, of course, um, legal advice is specific to the questions and there are also uh, jurisdictional differences. So, um, next slide. Here's our agenda for the day. Uh, we're gonna touch first on force measure and frustration and contracts, a, a vast preponderance of your questions related to that. Um, and so we'll spend a bit of time on that, employment issues that were asked, and then some copyright law, copyright law issues that were asked. So I'll turn the floor over to Jemaya. Thanks, Susan. So as Susan uh, mentioned, uh, we noticed that many of the questions that you had related to contractual solutions that might be available to assist you with cancellations and delays associated with COVID-19 and the lockdowns. In my section of this conversation, I'll give you an overview of what the concepts of force measure and frustration of contracts are and how they can be used. I'll try and answer as many of the questions that you had for us through this summary. Given that I practice in Ontario, here, my comments are largely reflective of the law in Ontario. However, I can say that the law regarding both of these concepts is fairly consistent across the country, with the exception of Quebec. I will, though, highlight where Quebec is different. Next slide. 
your starting point has to be the specific contracts that are in place. There are multiple clauses in your contracts that might be able to assist you in the present circumstances. The one that we'll focus on here, as I mentioned, is force majeure. But that's not to say that where you should, that's where you should end your analysis. You may be pleasantly surprised to find that there's other recourses available to you if force measure doesn't fit into the particular scenario that you're looking at. Some of those options are excusable conditions, delay clauses, and relief clauses. So force measure is what is often referred to as the act of God clause. Essentially what these do is identify which of the contracting parties owns a particular problem that is outside of the control of both contracting parties. The applicability of force measure is a very fact-driven question. Therefore, what is available to one party under one contract may not be available to other parties under a different contract. There's no standard template force measure clause. And in fact, these clauses can vary quite substantially from one contract to another. I've put a sample clause up for you just so you get a sense of what a force measure clause can look like. I don't recommend using this in your contracts though going forward. You would want a clause that's more tailored to you and addresses additional issues. However, this sample clause does illustrate what I mean by force measure. Now while I've said that force measure clauses can vary greatly one from another, there are some similarities. First of all, the goal. The goal, it relieves the affected party from damages or penalties arising from any delay or non-performance of obligations. Second is the content. Generally, every force measure clause lists out the type of events that'll be considered a force measure event, such as act of God, severe weather disturbances, war, terrorism, government restrictions, prohibitions, bans, shutdowns. Now, if you're hoping to invoke a force measure clause based on the current COVID pandemic, look for references in your, force measure, in your contract for pandemics, epidemics, global health emergencies, infectious or communicable diseases, global outbreaks, government regulations, actions, emergency measures, prohibitions, shutdowns. These are likely phrases that will trigger the applicability of the clause in the present climate. The third aspect of contracts, of force measure clauses that is generally consistent is control. So the force measure clause requires that the event be an event beyond the affected party's control and that the affected party could not have taken any steps to prevent its occurrence. That's why labor disturbances and supply chain issues are often not included in force measure clauses. It's considered that the responsible organizations should exercise due care and control over its approach. And then these, these events wouldn't technically be, on, be beyond their control. The fourth aspect is notice. So it might be required for the affected party to give prompt notice of an occurrence of a force majeure event and to provide a mitigation plan on how it intends to address, manage, and reduce the impact of force measure within set timelines. The last uh, sort of consistent me measure uh, across all force measure clauses is termination. And that's to mean that in some instances, force measure clauses will specifically identify that one of the effects of the clause is to give the parties the right to terminate the contract if the force measure event continues for a set period of time. For example, greater than 45 days. At the beginning of this presentation, I said that there were differences across Canada and certainly internationally in how these clauses could apply. So the first consideration in determining your potential recourse is jurisdiction. Where are your contracts made and what do the contracts stipulate as being the governing jurisdiction? The contract may have a clause that states that all disputes will be resolved in Ontario and governed by the laws of Ontario. 
meaning the jurisdiction and the governing law is Ontario. For some contracts though, they aren't as clear in terms of delineating that jurisdiction and further analysis is required. This jurisdiction and governing law point is exceptionally important. There are significant differences in certain jurisdictions, for example, between Quebec and the rest of Canada. So the concept of force majeure actually comes from Quebec, but in Quebec it operates differently than across the rest of the country. In Canada, excluding Quebec, you can only rely on force majeure clause if it's written into your contract. However, in Quebec, the civil code prescribes a force majeure situation and therefore force majeure will be read into every Quebec governed contract. So you may still be able to rely upon force measure in Quebec under the civil code, even if you don't see it specifically written into your contract. Once you've determined the jurisdiction and the governing law, there are four elements that we consider to figure out whether force measure could help you out. The first is does the event qualify as force majeure? The second is, is performance impossible? Third is, could you have foreseen and mitigated the risk? And fourth is, how do you want to fix it? So in considering COVID-19, what, what I'll do is I'll go through these four questions with you generally to help you understand whether or not your force measure or clause might help you in the situation that you're in. I won't be able to provide you with a definite answer as to whether force measure will apply in your particular circumstance without actually reviewing your contract because every contract is very different and it really does boil down to how your contract is worded and what the triggering event is. So first question, does this qualify as a force measure event? You would need to look at your contract and determine whether any of the triggers could fit. Does your contract refer to a pandemic, a public health emergency, government action, or a restriction? The question is therefore, are any of the scenarios that fit your particular circumstance identified in your contract's force measure clause? If not, what is there and can any of it apply? Some clauses are actually very broadly drafted and have catch-all phrases that might assist you. Some are very narrow and none of the descriptions will match and therefore you won't be able to use that force measure provision. So second question is what is the cause? Why is it that you can't perform your obligations? Understanding the cause will help inform the question of whether it is really impossible for you to fulfill your contract. So why is an artist not performing? Why is an event being postponed? Why is your facility closed? Ultimately, these answers will help you evaluate whether it's impossible for you to perform a contract because of the triggering event, or just unfavorable, unadvisable, or perhaps a preventative measure given the circumstances. If we dig into some examples, um, so is an industry directive for a temporary closure an appropriate force measure trigger? Well, I'd say, Again, it depends on your force measure clause. Does it include triggering events such as industry directives? Most clauses will require something more overarching like government action as opposed to a smaller industry action in order to, fit, in order to trigger a force measure. That leads into the next question of whether force measure is triggered if closure is the result of the government restrictions or regulations that have been put in place. It can if your specific clause stipulates the government restrictions, government regulations are a trigger of your force measure. It can also apply if your clause is broadly drafted to include more overarching principles and given that government restrictions and regulations are one of the more common force measure elements the courts may read that into a broadly drafted force measure clause. Preventative closures, on the other hand, do not usually trigger force measure. 
because they don't meet that impossibility standard, which is actually a really high test to meet. Finally, force majeure associated with COVID-19 doesn't necessarily get triggered when there's an incident of infection at your premises and conversely doesn't necessarily require a direct incident of infection at your premises to be triggered. On the other hand, as I've said previously, it really depends on the precise wording of your clause as to whether those events will fit into the circumstances. The third question that we would ask is, did you see this coming and could you have done anything earlier to fix it? The main piece of advice regarding force measure is that you have to act quickly. And that's primarily because of this foreseeability requirement. There is a very brief window to exercise force measure and given how far we are into the COVID-19 pandemic, that window is actually rapidly closing. The news is constant in terms of what the restrictions are and that those restrictions are being published across the world. Everyone is eyes wide open in terms of how this is snowballing. We know that many facilities are or were closed and that travel is restricted. How long have we known? Was it foreseeable that we would not have been able to operate? If not, did we act immediately after learning that we couldn't operate? Have we tried to mitigate our loss and respond responsibly? Those are some of the questions that you would have to ask yourself when considering whether or not force measure will apply. The law actually really does require you to mitigate the impact of the event wherever possible. So that'll be a big consideration when looking at whether force measure is going to be able to assist you. Lastly, think about what you want. Before you get too creative in terms of a resolution, the contract will likely specify the relief available to you. Oftentimes it's a relaxation of a time period obligation. There may also be financial solutions available. But as, and as mentioned previously, there might be an option to terminate based on your contract. Ultimately though, look to your contract to figure out what you're entitled to. But please do remember, these clauses are not applied lightly. They are not meant to be easy to, to claim. After all, the effect of a force majeure clause is to relieve the affected party of penalties or liabilities under a contract for non-performance, leaving the other party with no performance and nothing to incentivize the non-performing party to cure the default, so to fix the problem. It will be a long and uphill battle in order to exercise force measure. It'll also be an uphill battle that you won't win if you sit on it too long. In addition to timing affecting the foreseeability requirement that I spoke about previously, some force measure clauses actually have strict timelines when it comes to providing notice. So notice of a request to activate your force measure clause within 45 or 60, or sometimes it says 90 days. If you fail to adhere to those notice provisions, you'll likely be unable to rely on your contract. So your best option is to review your contract find a lawyer in your contract's jurisdiction, so going back to my first point, and come up with a plan as to how you'll negotiate a resolution so that you can avoid a substantial financial loss to your organization. The last point that I wanted to raise is with respect to what happens if your force measure clause doesn't apply, um, or if you don't have a force measure clause in your contract and you're not in Quebec. Well, there's also a concept called frustration. Frustration is different from force measure in that it's not a nicely wrapped solution to resolve an aspect of your contract. It's essentially like a parachute. And if your contract is the, the burning plane and you just pull a pin to get out, when the contract is frustrated, the entire contract blows up. In force measure, you continue to work with the other party you just excuse the other party from fulfilling one aspect of the contract. The opposite is true in frustration, where you rely on frustration, the entire contract is terminated. The thing about frustration though, is that it's a common law principle, not a contractual one. Therefore, it doesn't have to be written into your contract for it to be relied upon. Basically, the 
doctrine of frustration applies in very similar circumstances to force majeure. An unforeseen situation has arisen. The situation renders the performance of the contract radically different from what was contemplated. Um, like for force majeure, frustration has a very high standard and is not easily available. We have to prove a lot of the same things um, in order to get to frustration. The occurrence of an unforeseen event that directly causes your inability to perform, that renders your performance impossible from what you signed up for, and that there's not mere economic hardship or increased difficulty. It really has to be impossible for you to fulfill the terms of your contract. But if you're successful in claiming frustration, then your contract, as I mentioned at the beginning, comes to an end. It's not just suspended. So really, I would implore you to think strategically about what is best suited for you and what your ultimate goal is before you try and rely on frustration. In our experience, termination of the contract is not usually what people want. Typically, parties want to preserve that good contractual relationship, continue performance of their contracts once the event is over. Uh, the trend that we have been seeing is parties actually proactively engaging in open discussions, negotiating side agreements, or amending agreements to address their short-term challenges caused by COVID-19. And those are happening with a mutual good faith, sometimes with a co cooperation clause inserted into the new agreement that will allow the parties to continue to monitor the situation and extend or amend the temporary suspension or relief as necessary. So really this is a time where you're able to try and, and negotiate new solutions to get to a resolution that's satisfactory for everyone. Now I'll turn it back to Susan for a case example of force measure. Thanks, Jemiah. Um, so uh, that was a great presentation. A lot of what you've told us though is that it's very specific to the jurisdiction, uh, to the clause and to the facts uh, at hand, um, which is true. So, and I've seen some of your questions already, probably the answers will be very specific to your, your contracts and to your facts. But I thought it would be helpful if we looked at one set of facts, which uh, potentially many of you have seen uh, come up in your, in your situation. Next slide. Okay, so here's the situation. Um, there is a regional uh, theater, commercial theater, uh, that has a play scheduled to start rehearsals and performances in April. It was contracted uh, in February or January. And in March, uh, the restrictions, government restrictions came down that theaters had to close. So we have, a th the players are a theater, we have its a professional organization, the Professional Association of Canadian Theaters, and on the other hand, we have Canadian Actors' Equity, which represents uh, performers, directors, actors, uh, and the talent. And there was, a, we have a play that was supposed to go on, supposed to start rehearsals in, in April. Um, the contracts are CTA contracts, so Canadian Theater Agreements under the Equity and uh, now the play cannot go on. So the question is, what can the theater do about this? Well, we have to look at the contract, is what we learned from Jemiah. Next slide. Okay, so here's the CTA that governs uh, the engagement. In this case, we're talking about, let's say, the actors. Um, there's lots of clauses in this agreement, but uh, we're gonna focus on 37 and 38. Uh, 38 is cut off, but basically, in, in non-COVID or force measure situations, uh, theater can always terminate an artist with two weeks notice, in other words, uh, two weeks pay um, at the contractual rate. Okay, so that's one option. But we wanna know if we can, if section 37, the force majeure clause is triggered. So we've learned from Jemiah that we need to go through four elements. Number one, qualification. Is COVID, does COVID fall under, qualify for this clause to be triggered? Number two, uh, the impossible performance standard. Was or is the performance truly impossible? Three, foreseeability. Was the risk of non-performance foreseeable and able to be mitigated? And four, the remedy. 
what do we do about it if it is triggered? So let's go through each of these four elements. First, uh, qualification. Well, if you look at the wording of 37, it says um, if, if you know, a uh, company cannot rehearse or perform because of uh, prolonged illness or death of a prominent member of the cast, fire, accident, strikes, riot, acts of God or acts of the public enemy, we do not see pandemic listed in there. And frankly, none of them really qualify other than potentially acts of God, which is not a defined term. So um, there is a question mark whether COVID-19 would fall and qualify under this clause. I'll show you um, a bulletin that came out later between PACT and Equity that did acknowledge in some way that this clause could be triggered. Secondly, impossible performance. Okay, was the performance of this play Im truly impossible? Well, there was a government restriction that said theaters cannot remain open. Uh, to me, that seems that a performance and rehearsals that were supposed to take place in April uh, come pretty close, if not are already there, to being impossible. In contrast, if the play was scheduled for September, query whether it's impossible. We don't really know yet whether that play will go on or not. So that might be harder to, to fall under this um, clause as not as as uh, the company not being able to rehearse or perform so you may not you may be in limbo until we know more about september third foreseeability well for foreseeability timing matters in the facts that i presented the contracts were entered into before we knew there would be a shutdown uh, maybe we knew already in january certainly in february that covid was out there but we didn't know that it was going to shut down society in canada the way that it did um, and, and, and certainly, uh, we did not know that the theaters would be completely closed down in April. Um, that being said, if contracts were to entered into today for a performance scheduled for September, query whether we should have foreseen that, that, that the shutdown of that play might have happened. So that's the analysis there. And then the remedy. So in this case, you have to look at the clause for the remedy. This clause says that if... Um, the rehearsals or performances cannot go on because of one of these qualifying events, uh, the artist receives one seventh of the minimum fee as opposed to their contractual fee for each day on which rehearsals and performances are not given thereafter, including the artist's free day. And then should any of the foregoing conditions continue for a period of 10 days or more, either party may terminate. So it looks like, uh, first of all, the remedy seems to say that you can pay minimum, not contractual rate, and there may be a big difference between the two. Secondly, it says that uh, you're supposed to pay it for each day on which rehearsals or performances are not given. Query, and I don't think this has been tested at all, whether uh, in the case of the fact pattern that I gave where rehearsals were not supposed to start till April, this pay is actually due if rehearsals or performances were not supposed to be taking place on, these, on the first 10 days anyhow. Um, that may be a stretch of an argument, but it's there. And then certainly what happens after 10 days uh, is that you have the right to terminate. It doesn't say that you can postpone, it just says that you can terminate. So if you're postponing, you're not necessarily availing yourself of the latter part of the clause where you no longer have to pay the actors. Next slide. So as I was saying, PACT and uh, equity uh, put together a bulletin on March 16th and sent it out and agreed that Section 37, the clause that we were just looking at, has an interpretation that if a theater is required to cancel a performance or rehearsal for reasons beyond its control, doesn't mention COVID specifically, that Section uh, 37 applies in terms of paying uh, for 10 days of the minimum, week, uh, of minimum weekly pay, and then after 10 days, you can cancel. So um, although they say if it's out of the control of the theater, meaning you have to be careful, you can't just go and cancel all your performances, there's still this question of foreseeability and impossibility of performance. So if the plays are too far out, you may not be able to avail yourself of this clause. Thank you. Now I'll turn the screen on to uh, my partner, Andrew Bratt, to discuss some of your employment law questions. Andrew, are you there? Oh, 
Sorry, guys, I was having some technical difficulties. I'm here now. Okay, um, so on the employment issues, we received a number of questions, and unfortunately, given the uh, given the interest of time, I'm only going to be able to answer uh, probably two, maybe three of these questions. We'll see how quickly we can get through uh, the first two. So first and foremost, we were asked whether employment contracts can be revised to reflect the new normal. And specifically, we were asked whether or not we can update our contracts to change salaries, so presumably salary reductions, job descriptions, and other essential terms of the employment relationship. Uh, not surprisingly, many employers throughout the country are uh, looking to make significant revisions to their existing agreements um, as both a cost conservation measure and also to ensure the long-term viability uh, of the organization. So the short answer to the question is yes. Employment contracts can be revised, and where you are looking to make uh, fundamental changes to the essential terms of the employment relationship, you absolutely should try to amend those contracts either by way of a letter, an amendment letter, or a brand new agreement, depending on the extent of the changes that you're looking to make. That being said, depending on sort of what kinds of changes you're looking at, you may need to consider providing something of value in exchange for the employee agreeing to be bound by the new terms and conditions of employment. And this is a concept that we call fresh consideration. So when you entered into that employment agreement in the first place, the employee agreed to, a, to, to, to certain terms and conditions of employment. If you're now trying to modify those terms, and in particular modify them in a significant way, then generally speaking, you need to provide something of value to the employee in exchange for him or her agreeing to be bound by these new terms. In addition to that, you may also have to, or you should also provide them with an opportunity to obtain independent legal aid. You shouldn't do is present them with a brand new letter or a brand new contract and force it down their throats. Don't give them an ultimatum, i.e. sign here or we'll have no choice but to fire you. And, and, and don't do anything that would be perceived as sort of a, a getting them to agree to a new employment contract under duress. Otherwise, you might find that it becomes very difficult uh, to enforce the revised terms in the future, which defeats the purpose of the revised contract. When it comes to salary reductions, uh, there's also the potential for a constructive dismissal claim. A constructive dismissal claim is essentially a claim where the employee takes the position that the employer has unilaterally modified the fundamental terms of the employment relationship such that they've breached the employment contract. As I mentioned earlier, when you enter into an employment relationship, you do so on, on, on a set of terms. And when you do that, you can't just go ahead and modify those terms unilaterally after the fact uh, unless the employee consents. So where the employee doesn't consent, they're, they're free to take the position that you've repudiated the contract, you've breached the contract, and that they've essentially been dismissed as a result of those changes, in which case you trigger their severance obligations. And of course, that's not what you want to do. When it comes to compensation reductions, there are no hard and fast rules. But the courts have generally said that if you're under a 5% overall total comp reduction, you're probably okay. If you're between 5 and 10%, it's a bit more of a gray area. If you're above 10%, almost always it's going to trigger a constructive dismissal. What's interesting about COVID is that there's no clear indication, at least right now, what the courts are going to do with constructive dismissal claims that are due to COVID. So 10 weeks ago, or 11 weeks ago, whatever it was now, I would have been giving very different advice. I was giving very different advice. If, a, if an employer client had approached me 10 weeks ago and said, look, we need, for financial reasons, we need to reduce somebody's salary by 15%, the advice would have been, don't do that. You've got to look at other measures, other, other um, uh, less significant measures, because if you do that, you're essentially walking yourself into a constructive dismissal claim. As a result of COVID, uh, the global pandemic, government-mandated shutdowns, uh, where it's really not the employer's fault, most management side employment lawyers are of the view that the courts are going to have no choice but to be far more lenient and to relax the rules around what employers can and cannot do, especially when it's outside their control. So it remains to be seen how the courts are going to address these types of claims. We haven't seen any of them yet because A, it's brand new, B, the courts are closed, and C, for the most part, employees that are experiencing these kinds of reductions are sort of sitting back, um, not necessarily accepting the changes but realizing that the alternative is a layoff or a termination. And so they're temporarily accepting these changes and waiting to see what transpires in the future. What I would say is that this is not carte blanche to go make um, significant modifications to one's compensation package. The changes that you are making should absolutely be temporary. 
and they must be justified. And by that I mean, you know, don't don't reduce somebody's salary by 25% if you haven't had it, if you haven't experienced a decline in revenues. Of course, if you're, you know, if, if your business has been shut down and there are no revenues, that's a completely different story. But as you can appreciate, there's a lot of employers out there who are taking advantage of the situation and despite not experiencing a big reduction, are uh, looking at this as an opportunity to try to increase profits. Not to suggest that's what's happening in, in, in your space. But, but we suspect that when you do go before a court and you do try to justify the change, a court's going to want to see that if it's a salary reduction, it happened across the board. They're going to want to see that your C-suite executives are also experiencing a corresponding pay cut um, as well. When it comes to other changes, so non-financial non changes like job descriptions, the analysis is essentially the same. Again, it starts with the basic premise that you don't have the right to, to change the fundamental terms of the employment relationship. If somebody was hired for a very specific role, you don't have the right to unilaterally modify that role subject to what the agreement says. The agreement may have provided for some flexibility to make minor modifications. But generally speaking, again, if you're going to make changes to the job description, uh, to the role itself, to the duties and responsibilities, which may be happening now as a result of COVID, to the work location, for example, if you're going to be going to a work from home type scenario, it's important that you memorialize those changes in an agreement and that you get the employee's consent to the extent that you can to help mitigate the risk of a potential constructive dismissal claim. I should also mention that um, in the unionized context, the analysis is quite a bit different, and that's because wages and job descriptions are governed by the terms of a collective agreement. Uh, the collective agreement may require that you consult with the union before making such changes, and even if it doesn't, you may decide to do so anyway. Um, and it may require that you modify the collective agreement or that you enter into a letter of understanding either to suspend or alter parts of the agreement on a temporary basis. Suffice it to say, if there's a collective agreement in place um, with respect to the individual that you're, uh, that you're trying to make changes to, it won't be governed by an individual employment contract, rather the provisions of the collective agreement. And it's really important that you get specific advice um, around the interpretation of those provisions and how you make changes, if at all. Okay, the second question that we received, which I think is uh, probably one of the more common questions I'm getting across the board these days, is how can we ensure that artists and contractors or just employees generally are healthy before coming on site? Um, it's, a, it's obviously a fair question and it's an important question because not only do you have a moral obligation to ensure health and safety of your workers, you also have a legal obligation under occupational health and safety uh, legislation. And the rules are somewhat different across the country in various provinces, but generally speaking, every province has a, a, a you know, it requires that employers maintain a, health, uh, a healthy and safe workplace for all their employees. In normal times, that's not overly difficult to do, although I appreciate that in different industries it may be, so for example, construction. But generally speaking, maintaining health and safety for your workers is not overly complicated. It now has become very complicated because of COVID. And it's become problematic and it's become um, challenging because you don't, have, you don't have visibility into what your employees are doing in their private time, in their personal lives. You don't know if they're following public health recommendations. You don't know if they are engaging in social distancing or practicing social distancing. You don't know who they're exposed to, who they're living with, et cetera. And so it becomes very difficult to know whether or not you're putting everybody else in your workplace at risk by allowing that individual to enter into the workplace or to come on site. What we've also seen a lot of lately is uh, other workers that are expressing concerns. And some of this comes up because of social media. A lot of employees or friends on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it may be, and they see their, co their colleagues and their coworkers doing things that they don't necessarily agree with, not engaging in social distancing, and it causes them great concern. I will say this, there's no perfect solution. I don't have an answer for you in terms of how you can unequivocally, you know, categorically ensure that everybody is safe. What I can tell you is there are two measures that a lot of employers are, are adopting right now, and that, again, not, not, they're not perfect, but they are certainly helping to ensure a healthy and safe workplace. So they, they are temperature checks and wellness checks. I'll talk about each one uh, separately. Uh, with regards to temperature checks, I'm not sure what the statistics are right now in Canada in terms of how many employers are using them. I think you're going to see a dramatic increase. Um, for the most part, businesses that were designated as essential businesses started the trend because they've been operating all along. And now as the economy slowly starts to reopen, you're starting to see this more and more with uh, non-essential businesses. It's not a perfect solution. I say it's not a perfect solution for three reasons. First and foremost, you can have an elevated body temperature without being sick. And so the one example that's been brought to my attention uh, quite recently was menopause. 
um, there are there are other there are other circumstances in which you can have an elevated body temperature without being sick, and there's no way to know that. Um, number two, you can have a fever without having COVID, and number three, you can have COVID without having a fever. I think I saw a statistic recently that about 50% of people who have been diagnosed with COVID never um, uh, never had a fever throughout their you know throughout their symptomatic period. That being said, it's better than nothing. More often than not, if somebody has an elevated temperature. It's because they're sick, not always, but more often than not. And even if they don't have COVID, they probably shouldn't be in the workplace. So for the most part, testing for fever, which is typically defined as 38 degrees Celsius or 100.4 Fahrenheit and above, is not a bad idea. And it will give some comfort to the rest of the people in the workplace that you're at least taking some measures to ensure that you're not allowing people who are um, symptomatic to be, uh, to be present in the workplace. <clears throat> I will say that it's really important that the test only be used for the purposes of assessing admissibility into the workplace. So you literally take the person's temperature and determine whether or not they have a fever. If they have a fever, they're not allowed to be in the workplace. You send them home. If they don't have a fever, they can be admitted. The information should not be used for any other purpose, disciplinary or otherwise. There are some privacy concerns or considerations in certain jurisdictions like Quebec. Um, uh, BC and Alberta, where they have private sector privacy legislation. Ontario does not. We don't have enough time today to get into the privacy considerations, but generally speaking, so long as you are not recording uh, or storing or using the information for any other purpose, it should be fine. And so literally, you have a, a touchless thermometer, you take the test, and you determine whether the person can come into the workplace or not, and that's it. That's the last you hear of that report. There's no report that's stored. The information's not recorded anywhere. Uh, and there's no personal, personal or identifiable information that's maintained in any of uh, in any of your records. That being said, it's really important to establish a proper protocol uh, for how you're going to handle people who do test, uh, not test positive, but for people who have a fever. Are you going to just send them home for the day and allow them to come back when they're symptom free? Are you going to require that they self quarantine as public health recommends that you do? Those are questions that you have to give some thought to in advance. Um, and there is no right or wrong answer. There's many different ways to approach it, but that protocol really has to be established in advance so that you know exactly what to do once the person um, does in fact have a fever. In addition to temperature checks, the other um, strategy that a lot of employers are adopting right now is to conduct wellness checks. And it can be done verbally or by way of a written questionnaire. But in general, you're asking the employee three questions in addition to, or the contractor or any visitor to your work site. You're asking three questions in addition to taking their temperature. One is, have you traveled outside of Canada in the last 14 days? And you're asking that question because public health is, is basically mandating that anybody who's traveled outside of Canada and has returned in the last 14 days is required to self-quarantine. So you need to know if they've been outside the country. Not as much of an issue now as it was a few weeks ago because people aren't really traveling. Number two, it's the exposure question. Have you had any close contact with anybody who is a confirmed or suspected case of COVID? And this is a really important one because if somebody's had exposure, you need to determine A, whether or not the contact was sufficiently uh, close that they, they themselves have to self-quarantine. And it may depend on whether they're symptomatic or not. But you also have to determine whether or not they then have to tell you who they've had close contact with within the workplace so that you can then determine whether or not those people within your workplace have to also self-quarantine or self-isolate. And then thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, is the symptom question. Have you exhibited or are you experiencing any, uh, any COVID-related symptoms? There is no one-size-fits-all approach in terms of what symptoms you're asking about. For the most part, you're looking at fever, a cough that's not related to allergies, and shortness of breath or, or pressure in your chest. But if you look at the public health uh, list of symptoms, it's incredibly long, um, and it covers, covers things like a sore throat, chills, runny nose, even a headache. And so I'd be very careful before listing all those symptoms and depending on what your protocol is, because if you're requiring somebody to self-isolate for 14 days, if they exhibit any symptoms, you probably don't want to list a headache because there are lots of people who get headaches regularly and, have, and there's no reason to believe they have COVID. So typically you're looking at the most common symptoms, which personally I would include fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, sore throat, difficulty swallowing. Those are the most common ones. Other lists have things like loss of taste, loss of smell, et cetera. So you'll have to determine how deep you want your list to be. But those are essentially the three questions you're asking. And if the answer to any of these questions is yes, 
So yes, I've had close contact or yes, I'm symptomatic or yes, I've returned to Canada in the last 14 days. Then you need to consider what your protocol is. Are you quarantining until you're no longer symptomatic for a period of time? Uh, is it 14 days and 72 hours? And depending on which public health uh, agency you're, you're, you're looking at or you're relying upon, um, the protocol is going to differ. So ideally, anybody who's symptomatic or has had close contact with somebody who's a confirmed case would self-quarantine for 14 days. But we appreciate that that's not always possible and that may exclude too many people from the workplace. And so you may limit it to anybody who's confirmed as having COVID, anybody who's traveled, or anybody who's exhibiting any of the more common symptoms or two or three of the more common symptoms. So there's different ways to do it. To do it. And in some cases, you may actually want to consult with public health if you're not sure, because as good as the advice we can give is, we're not doctors. Um, and sometimes it's better to rely on uh, medical professionals to make that determination uh, for you. So I think in the interest of time, I'll probably skip over the third question, although it's an important one. Um, I do want to leave enough time to get into the, uh, to the other topics. So without further ado, I think we're going to move along. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, sorry that we couldn't make it to the third question. Again, we'll try to answer that question and your very good questions that you've been asking all along um, in some other format after this uh, presentation. So now, um, and by the way, uh, I know we called for this webinar to end at 11.45. We did start five minutes in and we probably need until noon. So uh, obviously feel free to drop off if you must and sorry for going a little bit longer. So I'll turn it over to Alexis now to answer your copyright law questions. Hi, thanks Susan. Um, so like Susan said, we're gonna switch focus now and talk a little bit about copyright law. Um, recently, we've seen that many organizations, especially in the performing arts sector, are acting quickly to generate and post digital content to keep their audience engaged and connected. Uh, when creating and distributing digital content, it's important to know your rights and also to be aware of the rights of others so you don't run afoul of them. And this becomes particularly important when using the work of others in your own content. So for example, if you're mu using music composed or performed by someone else, or if you're using a clip from TV or film or a recording of another performance. So in the slide, you'll see um, some of your questions that relate to copyright law here. So I'll speak for a few minutes about copyright broadly, and Susan will take over to speak about a couple real life examples that map onto the scenarios kind of described in these last two questions. So the question that underlines each of these three is what is copyright? So essentially copyright is a bundle of different rights that restrict others from re reproducing and otherwise exploiting an original work. At its core, copyright is the sole right to produce or reproduce the work, to perform the work in public, or if the work is unpublished, to publish the work and to authorize these acts. These rights pertain to the work or any substantial part of that work. The bundle of rights can be parsed, so each right can be dealt with individually. For example, you might allow someone to perform your play publicly, but you might not allow that same person to publish that play online. Copyright can also be limited temporally or geographically. So you might grant permission to use your work, but only for a specific amount of time or in a specific country. Uh, registration is not required for copyright to subsist. Original works automatically attract copyright protection. Excuse me. However, copyright registration can also offer um, certain advantages especially when it comes to enforcement. So if you've created a work that you think is valuable and in demand that others might try to copy without permission, you might wanna consider registering your copyright. So the works listed are the kinds of works that are protected by copyright, including every original production in the literary, scientific, or artistic domain, whatever may be the mode or form of its expression. Examples that are particularly relevant to the performing arts include illustrations used in set designs, scripts, choreographic works, cinematic graphic works, such as a taping of a performance, and always keep in mind that copyrights might overlap. So for example, in a sound recording, there's copyright in the performance that's captured in the recording, but also in the underlying musical work. You might also have to consider if that musical work contains a sample from another song or copies a substantial part of the lyrics from another song. 
So there might be multiple copyrights in a single piece of music. All work must be original to attract copyright protection, so it must be the product of an author's skill and judgment. Ownership. So generally the first owner of a copyright is the author or authors of a work, or the performer in the case of a performance, or the maker in the case of a sound recording. And the exceptions are here. Um, so a work made in the course of employment typically first belongs to the employer, or where ownership has been granted to another entity in the form of an assignment or a license that of course no longer belongs to the author. Um, in the course of employment does not cover independent contractors. So when using independent contractors, you should consider drafting contracts that set out ownership in advance. Think about who will own copyright before creating the work. It's quite messy to sort out after the fact often, especially if different people claim ownership or if different people were involved in various aspects of the creation of the work. Um, I'll mention briefly, because we're fighting against time, that um, there are some limited exceptions to copyright in which a, copyright, um, a copyrighted work can be used fairly. So without committing copyright infringement. And these exceptions include fair dealing for the purpose of education, parody, satire, criticism, news reporting, and non-commercial user-generated content. And now I'll hand it over to Susan to speak about some real life examples. Thanks, Alexis. Well, copyright 101 in four minutes, you did it. Sorry if that was a lot of information and maybe by applying it to real life uh, with these case studies, um, you might be able to uh, understand a bit more putting into practice what Alexis was uh, telling you. Alexis, next slide. So uh, a lot of you have been trying to find ways of connecting with your audience. Uh, here are a couple of examples. The Edmonton Opera um, posted footage of past performances on its website. And uh, the TSO came up with a uh, coming together of individuals performing edited together to perform a piece of music, Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring, which was beautiful. I'm sure many of you heard it. Um, so in these cases, uh, we're talk not talking about live streaming today. This these are about recordings that either existed pr previously or were made specifically uh, for online content during the pandemic. Um, the first thing and most important thing that I need to convey is that the fact that you possess a tape, whether that's a file, digital file, or whatever the form it takes, does not equate with ownership of copyright. So just because you have it in your possession doesn't mean you own it or that you can do anything with it. Um, and frankly, even ownership of copyright does not necessarily equate with your right to use it in any way that you want to. So step one is to figure out who owns the recording um, or the, the rights in the recording. In other words, the copyright in the recording. Alexis alluded to the fact that um, in the case of a recording, it's uh, typically the maker. That's a word used in the Copyright Act, and it means the person who makes the arrangements to tape. Well, if somebody's bootlegging a concert and they press tape on their cassette recorder, sorry to use an 80s example, they're the maker, even if they were unauthorized to do so. So they would be the owner of the copyright in the recording, although clearly would not have uh, many of the rights they would need to actually exploit that recording. Um, but similarly, even without a bootleg, you may have made a recording of a performance, but you may, uh, and, and therefore would be the owner, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily can exploit it in ways that were not contemplated or granted to you. So um, the step two is to determine, okay, what rights did you have in that recording? And step three is, are there any underlying rights? Again, Alexis mentioned that there may be overlapping copyrights, and have you acquired the rights to those, to other overlapping uh, copyrights in order to exploit these recordings in the way that you want. So first of all, uh, were you the maker? Do you own the copyright? That's step one, because if you don't, then you can't, uh, you can't exploit it in any way. Um, you may also want to make sure that you actually uh, acquired rights from all the people who, put, who performed in that performance. So if they're employees, as Alexis mentioned, uh, by, defi by, by operation of the statute, you would be the first owner as, uh, as the employer because it would be uh, work made in the course of employment. If they were not actually technical, technically employees, you would not get that right under Canadian copyright law. U.S. copyright law differs in this regard. Uh, so you would need to get an assignment from the people creatively contributing to that recording or that performance. 
Um, so, and you need a piece of paper actually saying that. Uh, in order to assign copyright, it has to be in writing. All right, so let's say we determine that you actually do own the recording. Do you have the right to post online, to make it available, to communicate by telecommunication, which is the, the actual technical words used in the Copyright Act for broadcasting over the internet? Um, well, uh, look, go back to the agreements, you know, the agreements for a theater piece with uh, the owner of the, the, the theatrical pr production or other contributors like the set designers or the cho choreographer. Did those agreements allow you to make the recording solely for archival purposes or were you granted full rights of exploitation or some, something in between? You have to determine that because if you only have a copy for archival purposes and those were the rights granted, you cannot post online. For, uh, for the public to see and, and consume, whether or not they're paying for that right to consume it. Um, and then also uh, always remember there may be other overlapping um, or underlying rights. For example, in the case of the TSO, they performed a piece of music. If that piece of music um, was in copyright still and did not fall into the public domain, meaning that copyright expired, you need to go get the rights from the publisher of that music to, to be able to make this available online. Again, whether or not you're charging or you're making this content available for free doesn't change that, that need. And at that, at 11.59, I will wrap this up. Uh, next slide. Thank you to my panelists, Andrew, Jemaya, Alexis. Special thanks to Alexis for helping me organize this and to our marketing team, including Rachel and Jennifer, um, and to Shannon who did the production on this. Um, obviously, we will, we're very happy that you were able to attend. We recommend that if you have specific questions, you uh, seek legal advice because if there's one thing that um, I hope is clear from what we've been uh, talking about today, whether it's in the employment, copyright, or the force majeure context, is that um, every, everything is very fact specific to your contracts and to your, your fact patterns. And so you may want to seek legal advice. Again, please subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, that may be the way that we respond to your questions and otherwise we're uh, constantly putting out good information and topical information that you might be interested in seeing. And thank you for joining. That will conclude our webinar.